morning, everyone. Welcome here. Let's stand up and worship the Lord together. Good morning and welcome to this time of worship at Pathfinder Church. It's good to see all of you here today. Today is 4th of July weekend, like you know, and that means it's time for us to celebrate the independence and the freedom that we have in our country, and that's a pretty big deal. But an even bigger deal is today is Sunday. It's Sunday today. That means it's the day that we celebrate the freedom that Jesus gives us from sin and from death. And that's something 
to celebrate every Sunday. And we're here to worship the Lord because of that. Listen to these words from the book of Romans. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that is God's grace. That is God's love for us. And we're going to continue to worship the Lord now and sing of God's amazing grace. For those of you online, we'd like you to leave a comment to say hi so that we can know that you are here. And we ask that you be in worship with us as well as we all go before God's throne and worship him together. Let's sing. One, two, three, four.
Good morning. Give it up for our praise band one more time. Woohoo! All right. I'm here with what you need to know about what's going on outside of something. Uh, just a reminder, we do have a pizza at the playground coming up this coming Wednesday. So come to the playground. We'll bring, bring the pizza. All you have to do is show up and uh, play and have a great time. Great chance to um, not have to cook. <laughs> we'll do it for you. <laughs> um, and let's check out this video. Uh, without hope, we fail. Without hope, we're doomed. Just like the Bible tells us, without hope, we have no future. This grill night is letting community members know that there's organizations and churches that love them and care for them. And when that uh, bill comes in the mail, that there's still hope. When the lights get turned off at night, there's still hope. When there's no food in the pantry, there's still hope. And that there are people that are here to support them, care for them, and uh, look out for their basic needs. In the next five or 10 years, I would love to see Kalamazoo lifting up their neighbors just as if they were family on a daily basis. So we here at Pathfinder are committed to serving our community. So we have partnered with Jesus Loves Kalamazoo, and our prayer and grill night is coming up uh, Wednesday, July 12, and we are serving at Milla Meadows uh, Apartment Complex. So if you are interested in learning more, you can stop by the Connect Desk. We can help you out. Uh, you can also go to the Jesus Loves Kalamazoo uh, website and find out more or sign up there as well. Um, you don't need to know much to help out. Just be willing to serve our community and um, be have a heart for Jesus in our in the city of Kalamazoo, Portage, and the greater area. So um, hopefully you can be committed to helping out with that. Um, and let's see. Uh, just a reminder, we got some one worship service uh, Sunday's coming up, and there is a time change, folks. This is not convenient for you. Please mark this on your calendar. July 23rd and 30, we have a 10 a.m. service. So if you come at 10.30, you will miss half the service. Come at 10 o'clock. Come at 10 o'clock. Or come at 9.30 and be on time. <laughs> <laughs> Please come at 10 o'clock or 9.30 uh, for July 23rd and 30, uh, one worship service times. And then we will have a town hall meeting on July 23. That is a continuation of the conversation about our United Methodist division. Um, so please be, plan to be here for that as well. And then if you hadn't heard, we had a giant day camp program here this past week. So we've got some pictures to show you from that. Maybe. that fast. We had over 50 kindergarten through fifth graders uh, and over 18 
uh, teenager through young adult counselors, and then a slew slash gaggle, whichever count you want, of uh, church members that were serving food throughout the week. So thank you for whatever you did to help support that program, whether it was wearing a wristband to pray for our campers and counselors all the way through being here to serve food or um, being on site to help. So um, lives were touched. Uh, Jesus was taught, and um, we had an amazing time, and um, Pastor Jake and I are exhausted, right? Yeah, okay. (laughs) So let's move on with our worship, and I know that I have some friends in the audience, so um, come on up, friends, and join me uh, up here on stage. I know that there are friends out there. Come on, guys, really, seriously. I know you're here. Oh, thank you. They're coming. Okay. Okay. There they are. Thank you. I was so lonely. Hello. There they come. Whew. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming up. I know. There. Oh, now. Okay. <laughs> I might regret my request. So, we have a big holiday coming up, don't we? Yeah. It kind of marks the, the middle of our summer break from school. But, and I brought a prop with me today. Can anybody tell me, does anybody know like, um, what the, the 50 stars on our flag represent? Emmett, do you know? Uh, you guys were paying attention in school. How about um, the stripes? Anybody remember what the stripes represent? No idea. Ooh, do you know how many there are? Mm. They're counting in their heads. I gotta see the wheels turning. How many are there? Close, so close. Austin, how many are there? Thirteen. There's thirteen of them. The thirteen original colonies. All right. And the red ones. Anybody know what the red on our flag represents? There's some fancy words, but what do you think, Landon? Okay. Yeah, that's one thing that it can represent. It also can represent valor or courage. Hmm. And, and you know, one thing we, we celebrate on 4th of July is the freedom that our country gives us, right? We celebrate our freedom. Mr. Steve talked about it a few minutes ago, that we, talk, we celebrate freedom to be in church, right? And we celebrate that freedom because other people fought for that freedom in the military, in the wars that they fought. So somebody else we can think about when we, when we come to church and worship, there's somebody else that we worship in that freedom. Who am I thinking of? Jesus, exactly. But what freedom did he die on the cross for us, our freedom of? What? Our sin. Exactly. When we ask Jesus to be our forever friend in our heart, he sets us free from our sins, right? Yeah. And so we celebrate our freedom as Americans, and we were reminded that with our flag, but we celebrate our freedom with um, our, with our, um, <laughs> from our sin, excuse me, from uh, when we come to church and we worship God and we celebrate that with our sin, freedom from sin with Jesus. And we reminded that like when we wear our crosses or when we come to church or when we read our Bibles. That's something I want you to think about this, that like as we celebrate and we light off our fireworks this week, or uh, maybe when you do a devotional at home this week, um, because it's just as important to celebrate the freedoms that we have in America as it is that we are able to worship in the United States, because not everybody has that freedom, right? There's some places in the world that they can't go to church like we can. Have you, did you know that? There's places that they can't do what we can do. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Will you, um, will you pray with me? Okay. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to set us free from our sins. 
help us to remember that we are so thankful that we are able to worship you and <clears throat> excuse me and be able to um, We're able to worship you freely, and we're able to celebrate the freedoms we have in our country as well. We thank you, and we love you. Amen. Like Christina just talked about, over the next couple days, we're going to be celebrating the freedom that we have as people that live in this country with fireworks and eating copious amounts of hot dogs and, and lots of other things. But we gather here together today to worship the one who really does set us free, free from sin and death and guilt and shame and all of those things. And because Jesus has set us free with his life, death, and resurrection. He is worthy of us offering our whole selves to him. And that is what we remember during this offering time. It's not just about dropping money in a plate or writing a check. It's about presenting our whole selves over to Jesus because he is worthy of that, because he loved us enough to set us free. So let's pray to him together. Jesus, you are amazing, and we are here to worship you with all that we are. Jesus, you are worthy of our, of our worship. You are worthy of our time, and we thank you so much that we have the time and the space to gather together to sing to you, to praise you, and to worship you with our lives. So God, as we, as we hear from you today, I just pray that you speak to our hearts that you use the words that you have given Brother Don to speak truth into our lives and to call us to something greater than what we came in with. God, we give you everything that we are. Whether we had a great week or a bad one, we lay that down at the foot of your cross, Jesus. And we know that when we do that, that you are faithful to take that and make something way better and way more beautiful than we could ever do with our own strength. So please take our lives, take this time, and use it in ways that only you can do, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Sing on the hill of Calvary my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from His side, no greater sacrifice. What He's done, what He's done, Glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Sing for the freedom. Glory and the honor to 
throne of majesty the father's will complete he reigns in victory sing hallelujah to the king he's worthy to Good morning, beloved of God. How's everybody doing this morning? You doing all right? Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Bubba, my hero right here. I'm running a little summertime cold on top of everything else that's been going on, so um, I just need to wet my whistle every now and then, so if you'll forgive me. Welcome to you that are joining us online uh, right now live, and then welcome to you who will join us online later on this week. We love having you with us as well. Uh, please drop us a comment, as Steve said earlier, and let us know you're here watching with us. And if you have any questions, send those in too. Um, well, it's Fourth of July weekend. We're celebrating freedom. Praise God for that. Praise God for what he's done setting us free. And today I want to start a new sermon series over the summer entitled Christian Living, and today we're going to talk about being doers of the Word. Doers of the Word. It comes from James, the first chapter. Each week uh, we're going to take a, chap a different chapter in James, and we're going to talk about uh, what James prescribes for us uh, on how to live our lives, our, our Christian lives daily. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at. So we're going to start with James chapter one, verse nineteen and twenty-seven uh, through twenty-seven. So uh, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives, and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. The Word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God indeed. Today we have a sermon title that I think you will all be familiar with. Or I should say a sermon theme that you will all be familiar with. Here it is. Just do it. 
Just do it. And as I said, we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled Christian Living. We could call this Christian Living 101. We could call this the very basics of living a life in Christ. We could name it all kinds of things. Um, The worship design team and I, a couple months ago, we were talking about what should we cover over the summertime, uh, and um, we decided that going kind of back to the basics as a way of refresher uh, would be a good thing to do. So here we are again in the epistle of James. Uh, I've taught from this epistle before in, in, in our sermons um, so three or four years ago already. It seem, doesn't seem like it's been that long already, but it has been three or four years ago. A little bit of background about James and this epistle uh, is always helpful. So let me share a little bit with you uh, right after I take a sip. James wrote this epistle as a general letter. That is, he did not write it to a specific church. You know, the church, James to the church at Smyrna, or, you know, James to the church at, uh, you know, Capernaum or whatever. He wrote it to the church, okay? Dispersed around the globe is basically what he says, uh, pretty much. Uh, And so he wrote it um, not to a particular person or to a particular church, but to the church in general, okay? He wrote it sometime in the late 50s, Okay? We're not talking 1950s here. We're talking about 50s. right? We, he wrote it sometime in the 50s. Um, uh, and so it was somewhere between 10, 15 to 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection that James wrote this letter. The exact date is unknown, but we, we, can, we can bookend it a little bit. Uh, we know that James was beheaded um, either by the high priest Ananus II or Emperor Vespasian, or perhaps both of them, actually. Um, Either way, uh, that occurred in the early 60s, so we know James must have written the letter before that time, so we figure somewhere in the mid to late 50s is when he wrote the letter. Uh, James is also, just to to talk about who James is, uh, James is understood to be the half-brother of Jesus uh, by most Protestants and and some Catholic churches. Uh, I say uh, half-brother, of course, because of his virginal uh, conception. You know, Joseph wasn't his real father, but he was his earthly father. Um, and James uh, was uh, the son of Joseph, as far as I know. That's my personal belief, anyway. Uh, others think he may have been a close cousin or a close kin of some type, but, but either way, he was certainly a relative of Jesus, most likely his, his younger brother. Um, and at the time that he wrote this letter, he was clearly the leader of the church, the leader of the Christian church, called The Way at that time, uh, in Jerusalem. Okay, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 15. He's clearly the leader of the church at that point. The epistle itself, uh, or the book of James, uh, is, said by, is said to be by w- at least one commentator, the Proverbs of the New Testament. So, so quips of daily living, the Proverbs of the New Testament. Um, interestingly enough, Martin Luther despised the book. Uh, He called it an epistle of straw. He thought it wasn't worthy of anything uh, in his preface to the New Testament that he wrote in 1545. Uh, But let's be fair to Martin Luther, too. Uh, You have to remember that he was fighting the very Catholic Church understanding of the insistence on being able to sell indulgences in order to get people into heaven, which caused him to be overly cautious about anything that smacked of works righteousness. And, and clearly, the book of James is very practical in its understanding. And, and so, Martin Luther thought, no, it's two works righteousness to me. I'm not going to deal with it. Uh, John Wesley, on the other hand, who is the founder of our faith walk, loved the book. He thought it was amazing. Uh, so, because by the time John Wesley comes along, uh, John Wesley is fighting uh, the exact opposite. The pendulum had swung all the way to the other side. You know, in Martin Luther's day, they're selling indulgences to get people into heaven. In John Wesley's day, they're, they're not allowed to do anything works righteousness because it, it was considered, uh-uh, no, can't do that, can't do works because, you know, we just got to sit in our pew and, and, and learn. And, and so the pendulum had swung the exact opposite direction. Wesley thought, no, it's, it's a great book. He loved it, and he described it as the remedy against the general temptation of leaving off good works in order to increase faith. Okay? And so that's Wesley thought it was essential for Christian living and Christian faith. So with that little bit of a backdrop about the book of James and James himself, 
let's uh, jump into our theme and text for today. Now, you all are very familiar with Just Do It, right? It was made famous by who or what? Say it louder. Nike, yeah, by Nike, right? Made famous by Nike, the sports merchandise company. Um, It's actually the brainchild of a man named Dan Whedon uh, of Whedon and Kennedy Advertising Firm. They're the ones who came up, came up with it. And, and, and actually, the, the um, CEO of, of Nike didn't like it at first, but, but we didn't talk them into it, and it's a good thing he did. Um, because many magazines and journalists describe the slogan as the best tagline of the 20th century. Best tagline of the 20th century. It connects the, the current situation with people and make them believe that they can be successful by wearing the Nike product. Just do it. If you just do it, you'll be successful, all right? The key to the tagline was that it was really short, it was simple, and memorable, okay? And and just do it uh, has gained several meanings over the years uh, as as it has progressed since the 1980s when it was created, Um, like things like commitment or victory or determination or perseverance, if you will, or grit, and the list goes on and on and on. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, friends, all right, that long before uh, Dan Whedon, long before Nike ever thought of the ideal of just do it, James, the brother of Jesus, came up with that concept, to just do it. That very concept can be found in our memory verse for this entire sermon series. I want you to memorize this verse. Before the end of this series, I want you to know it by heart. But don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. Okay? Just do it. Just do God's Word. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Nike's slogan insists that if you wear their sports shoes, you'll be successful. Well, James says that if you do God's Word then you'll be blessed, okay? Uh, So with that thought in mind, let's jump into our scripture for this morning. And and at at first blush, when I first read the scripture, this portion of the text, um, it it seemed a little odd to me until I began to dig deeper into it. It may seem a little odd to you that James starts off this section of the text uh, of being doers of the word by admonishing us and the readers to, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That, that was verses 19 and 20. That's what we started with. But there's a very valid reason why James starts off this way. In fact, the, in fact the, the James is attempting to clear the way for the reception of God's truth, the reception of his word within us. You see, the reception of the word requires a readiness to listen. It requires a readiness to listen, and it requires a readiness to restrain our speech. What James is saying here effectively is that a continual talker, of which I've been accused on more than one occasion, a continual talker cannot hear what anyone else says, and by the same token will not hear when God speaks to them. Now, that that spoke to me, okay? Okay. I see some other folks out there shaking their heads, right? Continual talker cannot hear what anyone else says, and by the same token will not hear what God speaks to them. Borrowing a phrase from Jesus himself, let those with ears listen. All right? Jesus said that in Matthew 11 and a whole bunch of other places. Okay? Likewise, likewise, those um, that are fiercely argumentative, right, they have a fiercely argumentative attitude, are not conducive to humble reception of the word. An angry attitude is not the atmosphere in which righteousness flourishes. we got to remember that. This is something that James will take up later in the letter, and we're going to talk about it in in a future sermon later on. For now, he simply introduces these topics to lead us into the first truth that he wants to teach us here this morning uh, and that he wants to share with his readers, and that is the implanted word, verse 21. The implanted word. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives 
and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. And humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. For it has the power to save your soul. That truth is the fulfillment of a promise God made to his people back in the Old Testament. This, this word right there is a fulfillment. See, I'm not sure James had it in his mind, although I, I suspect he probably did. I mean, we can't be inside of James' mind for sure, but uh, you know, being a very good Jew, he knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the promises of the Old Testament. And when I read that verse 21 right there, the, the, literally the first thing that popped into my head was Jeremiah 31, right? But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them in on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Implanted in our hearts, I will write them on their heart. God put his law of love in our hearts so that we would know. We would know. James says you got to clean out the junk. I don't know if y'all have seen my garage lately, but it's a mess. There's a bunch of junk in there. we got to clean out the junk and make some room in the heart for what God would plant within us. The Greek word that uh, James uses here that it translates to get rid of is, is the word apothemonoi. <coughs> Excuse me. Apothemonoi, which means having put aside, get rid of, or laying aside. And in the ancient world, what it, what it was used for was to talk about taking off old soiled clothing that was, that was no longer useful or that was, it was actually too much, taking off excessive weight of clothing unnecessary clothing, perhaps. Uh, and, and, and James uses it metaphorically, of course, speaking for the race of faith, taking off that which is hindering us from the race of faith, uh, encouraging people to take off the moral filth, just like stripping off dirty clothing in preparation for the acceptance of the Word of God, to, to remove the junk and allow the good stuff to come in. That's what he's talking about here. The Word is planted in you, and is the truth which is the saving truth. The word is already planted in the people he's writing to since they are all believers, so he is encouraging his folks to a more full and intelligent appropriation of the truth as they grow in spiritual understanding. They've got to grow in this spiritual understanding. It's been planted there, now you've got to use it, you've got to understand it. Okay? God's word is implanted within each and every one of us when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Where does it come through? It comes through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And he implants our word there. And he expounds on the word there. He teaches us the word there. He directs us toward the word there. And then James says, not only has, is it implanted in you, but now you have to do something with it. If it just sits there, guess what? It's useless. So he says, now you've got to be a doer of the Word. A doer of the Word. God implants the Word within you. Now you've got to do something with it. So don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Hmm. Hearers only of the Word are deceiving themselves, friends. If we think that merely listening to a message on Sunday morning, or at a Bible study, or even in life group, or youth group, or Sunday school, wherever, day camp, if we think listening to a message is what we need, we are sadly mistaken. It's not all we need. Yes, we need to listen to the message, but then we have to do something with it. Listening does not earn us any special favor with God. I want to say that again. Listening does not earn us any special favor with God unless we do something with it. 
When speaking about this particular verse, Wesley said these words, that grand pest of Christianity, a faith without works, was spread far and wide. And he's talking about the church of his day, in the 1700s. That grand pest of Christianity, a faith without works, has spread far and wide, filling the church with a wisdom from beneath, which was earthly and sensual and devilish, which gave rise not only to rash judging, but to every evil work. He preached that in a sermon called The Mystery of Iniquity. The verse, this verse, verse 22, is the very heart of James's letter. This one sentence sums up the entire book. You learn nothing else today, learn this one sentence. It is our memory verse. Chapter 1, verse 22. That's why I chose it to be such. And then James goes on in the next couple of verses and actually in the next several uh, chapters to tell us why. But in this next couple of verses, he uses a metaphor to help us understand. He says, look, he says, this is like someone who takes a mirror and they look at their face in the mirror, okay? They look at their face in the mirror and they study their face really intently so they make sure they get all the details, okay? They know you know, and then they walk away from the mirror and forget what they look like. They walk away from the mirror and for, huh? Sort of out of, you know, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing, which is, of course, is really ludicrous, right? I mean, you're not going to forget what you look like instantaneously when you walk away from the mirror. You know what you look like, for the most part. You, you'll remember it, right? But it is no less, James says, it's no less ludicrous for a believer who listens to the truth of God and does not remember to put it into practice. It's the same thing. You look in the mirror, you see yourself, you know what you look like, you walk away, you, you forget what you look like. No, you don't forget what you look like. That's, that's crazy. That's ludicrous, right? It's the same thing. James says, you can't read the Word of God, know the Word of God, and then do nothing with it. That's just the same kind of ludicrous thinking. The blessings only come when the Word is put into action as we experience God's love pour out of us to others and vice versa, from others to us. That's when the Word of God is experienced. Beloved, we don't want to be fools who are only fooling ourselves by not doing anything with what we know. Okay? Good works does not bring us salvation. I want to be clear about this. Good works does not bring us salvation. That's the thinking that Martin Luther was fighting against in his day, in the 1500s. Church wanted to say, if you just pay for this, pay for that, you'll be good to go. No. No. But on the other hand, good works joyfully flow out of the fact that we are saved by God's grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Wesley is trying to espouse. Good works flow out of that joy that we have because we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And then finally, James says this. He speaks to the change in our life that stems from knowing the truth and acting upon it. Okay? He says, word, not world. Word, not world. Look at what he says there in verse 27. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. And, not or. It's both and, not either or. We can't serve the poor, but let the world corrupt us. Nor can we not let the world corrupt us, but never serve the poor. It's both and. What, James, what is James trying to tell us here? The kind of religion that God our Father, and by the way, religion has gotten to be a really bad word, unfortunately, in our modern day. But it's really not a bad word. It's really not. Okay? 
The kind of religion that God our Father accepts is that which exerts a positive influence on our life. A positive influence on our life. Okay? This text does not give us so much as a definition of religion uh, as it presents a concrete way of insisting that genuine religion is a life-changing force. Transformation is what we want. Not knowledge. I mean, we need knowledge to begin with, but it's got to result in transformation. Right? So the results are both an outward expression of faith and an inward change of heart. Both and, not either or. The outward expression is the care and the nurturing of those who are less fortunate than we are, personified in, in this case, in James's case, by the widows and the orphans, because they were the particularly vulnerable folks in his day. Right? We could add any other downtrodden persons and still be true to James's thoughts here. We could, we could talk about the homeless down in Kalamazoo. We can talk about those folks who who have less than we do in Mill and Meadows, that, where we serve them with Jesus Loves Kalamazoo. That, and we would still be right within the context of this, of this understanding. This is the outward expression of love to others. That's the first half of it. But there's a second half. The inward change of heart is God's call for us to be holy. Holy. That is what James means when he warns us not to be sullied by the world around us. We are called to be set apart from this world. That is, we are to strive towards holiness and, and what Wesley would call Christian perfection. His Christian perfection was perfect love of God and others. What is the world? Since James talks about it and he says we should, we should go with the word, not the world, what, what is the world? What's our understanding? Well, that describes the total system of evil that pervades every sphere of human existence and is set in opposition to God and to righteousness. That's so good, I've got to say it again. It describes the total system of evil that pervades every sphere of human existence and is set in opposition to God and to righteousness. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about this in a few weeks in another sermon where James goes into even more detail. We'll talk about it later, but he introduces it here. Let's talk about how the Apostle Paul defines the world. Ephesians 6, 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world, and against every evil spirits in the heavenly places. Right? It's a battle, dear friends, and it goes on every day for your soul and for mine. We cannot be sullied by the world. James tells us to give up the world and to seek the word in our life instead. Again, I, as I said, we're going to talk about this more in, in the ensuing weeks. So what about today? What does this mean for you and me today? What are we going to do? You remember uh, last week, for those of you who were here with us last week, Christina challenged us. You know, she said there's 168 hours in the week, one hour in church. You know, it doesn't cut it. What are we going to do with the other 167 hours we have in the week to work on? So how can we do the Word in those remaining hours? Here are some thoughts. But again, by no means is this an exhaustive list. Okay? Here are some thoughts. You can make up a myriad of a, 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 a bunch more. Okay? First one is this. May I again, please? You, you'd think I'd remember to bring mine this time, wouldn't you? All right? These things are awesome, and they're terrible. They are awesome and terrible all at the same time. Oops, picture's upside down this time. Very nice picture of Jake's and Paxton, by the way. Scrolling, scrolling, mindlessly scrolling. One hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. 
some of you may be saying, well, Brother Don, I don't have one of those. I don't mindlessly scroll. Well, maybe you binge watch. Right? How about giving up the mindless scrolling on Facebook or Twitter or whatever other platform you have that you use, television, doesn't matter, and spend some of that time focusing on God's Word? Because we do have to know God's Word, okay? I mean, it's not enough just to know God's Word, but we do have to know it first, right? We have to be familiar with it to start with so that we can know how to act on it. Thank you again. Um, So the first thing is, you know, stop the mindless scrolling. Just stop. I catch myself doing it. I know. I'm, I'm guilty too. You know, I'll be sitting there, and the next thing I know, it's 20 minutes have gone by, and all I've done is this the whole time. What a waste of time and energy and effort. Stop it. Spend it on God's Word. First one. Second one, and these are just, they, these came off the top of my head, so, I mean, they're in no particular order. They, they, they don't even coalesce very well together. But the next thing is, how about supporting a child around the world somewhere? Right? I mean, he was talking about orphans, so it came to mind. Um, through organizations like Church World Service or Child Fund International or any of those other support vehicles that are, are available in the world today. You want to know something more about them, I, I can tell you about the ones that I support. I support two children right now. Uh, I support one child um, in India, and I've been supporting him for uh, almost six years now. And um, I support another child in Suriname. And I'll tell you the truth, that it costs me $63 a month to support those two children. And I don't miss that money at all. I have it automatically debited out of my account, and I never see it. I never worry about it. It, it doesn't bother me. I don't miss that money in the slightest. And those kids are taken care of. They get to go to school. They get fresh meals every day. They get, the, they get to have uniforms so they can go to school. For $63, two children for the entire month. Do something like that. Here's one that I thought of while I was sitting here in the church one day. Why don't you adopt a widow or a widower here in this church? We've got a ton of them. You want a list? I'd be happy to share. We've got a ton of widows and widowers in this church. And you know what it would be really nice? It'd be really nice if someone just sent them a card every now and then saying, hey, I was thinking of you. Or took them out to lunch. Or, you know, just sat and visited with them for a half hour. Once a month every other week, whatever. Why don't you adopt a widow or a widower? Again, James was talking about widows, you know, loving on them. And we've got a bunch of them in our church alone. And we don't have to go outside the church to find them. They're here. We've got a bunch. And then this last one now, this last one's um, not going to be as obvious. But we've got to watch out for the subtle changes of the word that the world is trying to offer us. Some of them aren't so subtle. Some of them are pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of them that are subtle. You you remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan? How did Satan tempt him? He tempted him by misquoting or quoting out of context Scripture. So be careful. Be careful. The world wants us to be more comfortable with our faith. And that can be deceiving. Don't fall for it. Be wary of new interpretations of Scripture that have not stood the test of time or the scrutiny of the church for two millennia. Be very wary. Be careful. And there are many, many more ways to do the Word. If you're unsure, ask a staff member, ask Pastor Jake, ask myself, Pastor Ron, whoever. So finally, let's end end with this thought then. Um, You know, Nike has an emblem and a slogan. Okay, their emblem is that little swoosh, you know, the kind of checkmark swoosh. That's their emblem. And their slogan is just do it. Okay? We as Christians have an emblem. It's called the cross of Calvary. And James has given us a new slogan. 
Just do it. Just do the Word. Right? So when you hear from now on in, when you hear, just do it, what are you going to think of? You're going to think of sneakers? Or are you going to think of God's Word? That's what I want you to think about today. Just do it. Sneakers? God's Word. Just do it, dear friends. Amen? More on this to follow. One of the ways that we can just do it, that we can live out what God's Word tells us to do, is by loving and caring for each other. Jesus gave us that instruction himself to love and care for our fellow believers. And I've got a couple of ways that we can do that today and throughout this week. First prayer card today comes from Bubba, and he's asking for prayers for himself and the cast of his play because they are having their opener this Friday. Our next one comes from Patrick and Tanya Murphy. Um, earlier this week, Tanya passed a kidney stone, and she's asking for prayers that, that she does not get another one and that their baby continues to grow strong and healthy. It's a really great prayer. And then our final one is from um, the Mann family. And they're asking for prayers for their niece, Andrea, who just gave birth on Friday to a very healthy baby boy named Cohen, which is amazing, and we celebrate with you guys. However, the delivery was a little bit rough on mom, and she is needing multiple blood transfusions because of that. So we'll be in prayer for Andrea. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are an amazing God, and we thank you so much that, that you not only walked with us 2,000 years ago, but you continue to walk with us today through your Holy Spirit. So God, as, as we go through, through difficult things and, and medical emergencies and, and tough decisions in life, we know that you are walking with us, and we are so thankful for that. Your word tells us that, that you are closer than our very breath in times of need. So God, as people are going through those difficult things and situations, I just pray that they feel your spirit being closer to them than the, our very breath. And God, I'm also thankful that you celebrate with us in the good things. We just had an amazing week at camp where you moved in incredible ways and lives were touched and changed because of your love. And we are so thankful and we celebrate that along with all the angels in heaven. And God, we just ask that, that you help us to continue to live out the spirit that was with us this past week. Help us to, to get to know you every day. Help us to spend time with you in your word and through prayer. Help us to know your heart. And then give us the courage to live out what we've experienced in our time with you. Help us to not just hear the word, but help us to live it out in our everyday lives, in our relationship with people. Because that is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. Help us to, to bring down the kingdom of heaven in our everyday lives and interactions with people so that they can experience just how good you are too, Jesus. Thank you for being with us and speaking to us today. Help us to go from this time and this place together, being encouraged to not just spend more time with you, but to live out what you have asked us to do. Because you are worthy of that, Jesus. You are worthy of our time and our effort in living the way that you have called us to do. Because when we do that, we know that your kingdom will come. We love you, Jesus. Amen. There is another way we can do the word. And we find it here at this table. The night in which Jesus gave himself up for us. He took bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat this. This is my body given for you. And then when the supper was over, he took the last cup of wine for the traditional Passover meal and he held it up and he blessed it and he 
said to his disciples, take and drink from this, all of you. This is representative of my blood, a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins for all who would partake. And so we remember God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ our Lord on that night. He called us to come and remember him and the acts that he did by coming to this table as often as we would. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And so we do so in remembrance of Christ. Would you join me in Christ as we proclaim the mystery of faith? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit, Father, on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen and amen. I would ask those who are going to help me serve, please come forward. And then immediately right behind them, if the praise band would come be led first or fed first so that they could lead us in music. Friends, I want you to be clear. I want to be clear on this. You do not need to be a member of our church in order to partake in this table. Christ sets this table and he invites everyone who wants to come forward to come forward. So we encourage you. Um, those who are serving, would you put on gloves, please? Anyone who's, who else is serving? Tracy and, and Mary, you come over here. Mary, you take that. Tracy, Mike, and Susie. Okay. There we are. Thank you. All right. Friends, we have gluten free um, elements here in the middle as well if you need gluten free. Uh, instead of taking one from the tray, then you just take one from here.
become the last. Let the poor put kings to shame. being here with us today receive this blessing may the grace of the lord jesus christ may the love of god the father and may the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all and all god's people said amen, amen. three four one <laughs>